All right, if you've got your Bibles, once you grab them out, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 5 as we've been in for the last month or even more now, really focusing in, as we often say, Scriptures, it's just this wonderful opportunity both to kind of at times, as we have in different series, take large chunks and get this kind of bird's eye view of a theme or a section or a book of the Bible. Other times there's value in kind of really drilling down into the intricacies, trying to really grasp and, and grapple with some important truths. And our focus during this particular sermon series is looking at the, the way of Jesus through his greatest sermon ever preached and specifically these upfront pillars often known as the Beatitudes, taking one a week to delve down into, to examine to allow, we pray, the Lord to illuminate them, not just to our minds, but to our hearts. So let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you and give you praise for what it is that you are doing all across the planet, all across the world, in this place this morning, in, in our lives personally, and in our lives as a church. Lord, thank you that you are a God who is always at work, even as we sung this morning, when we see it, and when we feel it and when we don't, we thank you that we can trust the process, we can trust your faithfulness, we can trust that you are the God who completes the good work that you have begun. And that's what we desire to be a part of, your kingdom, your will, your purposes, your plans. So we pray even this morning, Lord, come and have your way. Come and open our eyes, may we see you more clearly, may we love you more deeply, may we shine for you with ever-increasing brightness, making much of the greatness of your name. That's our desire and our delight, King Jesus, we pray in your wonderful name. Amen. Are you with me in Matthew chapter 5? Let me give you a little bit of background for those who perhaps haven't been here the last little while. We set the series up, and then as I said, we've taken each one of these pillars, these foundations that Jesus has given us. We started off uh, reading the beginning of chapter 5. It says Jesus he gathered the crowds together. He went up to the mountain. When he sat down, the disciples came to him. He was the first one that we covered. He taught them this, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And of course, we unpack that looking at this notion of a kingdom that Jesus preaches, he proclaims, and throughout this particular a sermon that he gives, it's continually mentioned. Seek first the kingdom. It's all about this kingdom. He says the kingdom of heaven, it's, it's here and now. And we, we sort of wrestled through this tension of the, the here and now and the not yet. But seeing that without any shadow of doubt that Jesus is proclaiming that a kingdom has come, that a new age has dawned, a new era has begun, the king has come. He's come to rule, he's come to reign, he's come as the Savior who would establish his kingdom through dying and rising again and then inviting and making available this kingdom. To who? Not to the great and mighty, not to the ones who themselves could work their way and their own strength towards that which he offered. But he says the kingdom's available to the spiritually bankrupt, the poor in spirit. He then goes on, Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Doesn't perhaps look like a great encouragement as Jesus unpacks the kingdom beginning to talk about mourning. But we looked at this notion, this concept of mourning allowing us to see the world for what it is. Allowing us to see ourselves for who we are and ultimately to see Christ in this full reality of the beauty of who he is and what he came to accomplish, remembering that mourning is not the end. That's not his intention here. It's a, con a context, a backdrop. It's the reality of the brokenness and depravity of sin against which Jesus steps into. Into the midst of the brokenness, bringing healing. In the midst of despair, bringing joy. In the midst of chaos, bringing peace. In the midst of our own sin, bringing salvation, the salvation that he alone offers. And then last week, Adam did a great job, and he looked at this particular phrase, blessed are the meek, some translations say, the humble, for they shall inherit the earth. And amongst many other things, we see this kingdom revealed, and a king, this radical picture of the king of glory, 
who steps down to do what? To enforce his authority? No, he steps down rather to wash the feet of his disciples, to show us what humility is all about, to proclaim the greatest in his kingdom is the servant of all. And you think, why? There's there's many pictures that Adam brought out. I think one that sticks to me is this reality that the heart of the kingdom and the king is not resistance, it's redemption. The clarion call of the gospel is not, let's resist, let's push back, it's let's come into the midst of and redeem. It's not from the outside in, from the top down, it's from the bottom up. That's how his salvation operates and that's how we are called to live our lives. That's just for review. Are you ready? Here we go for this morning. I know it's one verse, so let's wrestle through this and think through what Jesus is teaching us in this passage. Verse 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Let's read it again. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what? For righteousness. What's that? We'll unpack that. For they shall be satisfied. See, we're talking about satisfaction. That word, first of all, let's start there. It means, if you go to just a basic concordance, it means to be, uh, to be so full and so fed and so satisfied. Some translations uh, interpret this as to be gorged, to be overfed. Not just a little, but completely and utterly and totally satisfied. So there's satisfaction, and let's camp there for a moment. This, this is the overarching theme here that we'll unpack a little bit this morning. See, we've seen a kingdom that comes to establish rule, reign, and authority of the king. We've seen a kingdom and a king who's come to put things right in the midst of the brokenness. We've seen a kingdom that is to spread and inherit the earth, not as it resists, but as it redeems And we see here a king and a kingdom who comes to satisfy the very longings of the human heart. It's a fascinating, but it's an important thing for us to wrestle through. Jesus himself, he uses his language. He says, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He's saying, I I am like bread and water. I bring satisfaction. I'm here to satisfy the longings of the human heart. Let's go back to the beginning. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. See, as so often we see, Jesus uses a, a physical reality to point us towards a spiritual truth. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'm sure all of us know what it is to be satisfied by a good meal. And I'm sure all of us, to some degree, know what it is to be hungry. If you've got teenagers in your house, as we do, that seems to happen more often than not. They're always hungry. Insatiable hunger. But this past week, my wife and I celebrated 20 years of marriage. Thank you. I think if we're clapping anything, it's her long-suffering patience putting up with me for 20 years. But we booked in a nice meal to celebrate our 20th anniversary, amongst other things. We'd been meaning for some time to go to a place in the city, simply called the Meat and Wine Co. Anyone been there? A few people, a few hands. I just like the name. I mean, isn't that just pure and simple? No fan, just meat and wine. What, what else is there to a good meal? But if you've been there, it is kind of like a glorified steakhouse. And uh, all sorts of meat. So we had meat for the entree. We had this delicious... Does anyone want to hear about the meal? Or are we already tuning out? This tartare, just delicately prepared. It was steak and it was ribs for the, uh, for the main meals. If there was meat on the dessert menu, I would have chosen that too. But there, unfortunately, we've, we've had brisket before for dessert. That is a thing. That's a whole other story. But it was this delicious meal, and of course it did come with a hefty price. In fact, I look at the, looked at the menu and thought I could probably purchase for our property a cow or two for the price of the meal. But it was very nice, very satisfying, and the food, of course, surpassed only by the beauty of the company. Where, oh, there's my lovely wife there. Had to get that in there somewhere. 
The reason I bring that up is for this reason. See, we, we had this meal planned and we'd been thinking for some time about the, the meal that we would enjoy together, the beauty of the food that would be prepared for us during that special evening. And one thing that we did not do on the way, in fact, I, I didn't eat lunch, I think I might have had a small breakfast, but I was ready for this meal. I was anticipating, I was hungering for this deeply satisfying meal. And so we did not on the way as we headed there say, hey, why don't we just stop through McDonald's? Let's just grab a slice of pizza, maybe some bags of chips, let's just nibble all the way there and see, if, you know, see how full we can get before we enjoy this meal especially for the, the price tag that was offered in this meal, I was thinking, I'm going I'm to make sure I am as hungry as I possibly... I'm not going to let anything impinge, even the thought of how much each mouthful is costing me. I am just going <laughs> to delicately and deliciously savor every aspect and moment of this very fancy and deeply satisfying meal. Now, that's a little bit like what Jesus is saying in this passage. He's saying there is a context here. We were made in the natural to hunger and thirst. We talk about this, but we're made spiritually as beings who were made to hunger and thirst. The question is not, will we get hungry? And the problem with a deeply satisfying meal is I still woke up the next day and I was still hungry. Anyone notice that? I still was. The question is not, will we hunger? And thirst, it's what will we turn to to satisfy that hunger? And really the good news of Jesus in the kingdom here this morning is saying, there is something on offer and it's far greater than a 182 grain fed premium aged steak. As deeply satisfying as that is, there's something far greater. So will you hunger and thirst for that reality? Or will you snack away and fill your life with the junk food with the, the snacks, the little delights of this world that so often appeal and ultimately bring so little genuine satisfaction. So he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what? Well, the passage, is, passage here says for righteousness, and righteousness is not mentioned here alone. There's six references in this sermon alone, including as Jesus brings this to a conclusion. And he says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. So there it is again. This is something that we should be pursuing. Not only are we blessed, but he's saying that's the pursuit of your life. The king, his kingdom, and his righteousness. And so we see there that righteousness is not something here, is it? We're seeking something that is his gift to give us. So what is righteousness? Well, again, if you go to a basic definition, if you look up Strong's, it simply says this. And it's a little bit vague and dubious because there's a lot of debate behind this. But the, the basic definition is a condition acceptable to God. But let's just unpack. If that's good for you, you can take that one. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But let's just unpack it a little bit because there's more discussion around this than a lot of other topics in this area of Pauline theology. What, what is righteousness? What does that actually mean? There's two main camps here. One is, we could call it, the traditional, reformational view and perspective on righteousness. Now, the scene there for for righteousness and being declared righteous, and it's a good one. Both of these are good. I should say that in advance. But it's a scene. Imagine yourself in a law court. It's a law court setting. You're standing there as the convicted criminal. You admitted that you're, you're guilty. You've fallen short. And then in comes Jesus, uh, not really as an extra, but really as the judge himself, who says, this man has been guilty, declared guilty of all crimes, but I will pay the penalty. And so he steps in in our place to pay the penalty that we deserve so that as that penalty is paid, we can be declared forgiven and righteous. Who said that particular view before? Any good? Only three of us. Okay, a few more. Great. Right, fantastic. Just checking. All right. It's, it's a wonderful and a traditional view of righteousness. The requirements of the law are fulfilled. You've been declared innocent and therefore we are righteous. Now, there's a, a, we'll call it a more recent view, a covenantal view of 
righteousness. I say new, but it really began back probably in the 1970s and has been the focus over the last probably 20 to 30 years of much scholarship in this particular area of Pauline theology. What what is Paul in particular? What are the Gospels? What does Jesus mean when he's talking about righteousness? And it doesn't dismiss that, but it says we feel like that's not quite the entire picture, that yes, that's certainly part of the process, that we've been declared innocent, we've been forgiven of our sin, but really it's much deeper and it's broader and more wonderful than that. And in fact, often the picture that's used is rather than a courtroom setting, imagine that moment as... The, the father of the prodigal son, he greets his boy, his boy who's gone away and squandered his inheritance, said, I wish you were dead, taken the money, spent it all on wild living, and he, he comes back with a repentant heart. And what does the father do? The father embraces him. The father puts a ring on his finger. That's a, a signet of who he is, saying, you are my son. You've never lost your... This, this is who you are. He puts a robe around him. He brings him into the house. He puts on a feast to celebrate that his son, who he thought had died, has returned. So one picture, it, it emphasizes and it holds up that the, the righteous requirements of the law have now been fulfilled, that Jesus has paid the price, that we are forgiven, that we're declared righteous. Another one says this. It's the covenantal God of mercy welcoming you back into his family. It's God declaring that he knows you, that he's loved you, that you've been been bought by his blood, declared righteous, declared loved, declared worthy, declared that your life is of great value and worth and significance to him. I think it's a wonderful picture. See, one, one describes more the means of righteousness One describes the markers of righteousness. One describes more the process, which is good and important. One is a description of the position. One's more ecclesiology, one's more soteriology. How we get saved or what it means that we are saved. So what's the correct answer? You know me. You know I'm going to land right in the middle, don't you? I'm going to say both. Let's let the theologians argue it out, and there's great material on both sides of that debate. But let's embrace both, because I think they're both wonderful pictures of what it means, and it's an important word for us to understand. Righteousness means to be known by God, to be loved by Him, to have been brought in, to be declared righteous, declared loved, declared worthy, declared that your life is of value. It's not blind, pitiless, indifferent, It's the intentional mercy and magnificent workings of a God who so loved us. And so here's the point, and we'll elaborate this a little bit further. Blessed, Jesus is saying, are those who hear those words. You are righteous through what he's done. You are my beloved son, and daughter. And I would suggest that that very truth and revelation is the essence of what every human heart longs to hear. It's what we're searching for. What wealth, what status, what success, what nibbling on the table of the world could in any way compare to that which is on offer? To be declared that, yes, you were guilty, but you're forgiven. But even more, to be declared that you are my beloved son. Here's a robe and a ring and an invitation to the greatest party of all human history. As the great God of love declares and demonstrates and gets a little excited in the process. At what he has done and won and made available to us. See, I mentioned earlier that we... We've had a great journey this last term, kind of delving into some societal issues, looking at some of the ideologies of the world. And we are in this kind of clash of worldviews and clash of cultures. And we, uh, we spent last Wednesday night looking at some of these issues, particularly around ideology. And the world has made issues of sexuality, not just an ideological statement, but part of their very identity. And we had, and I'll leave the details vague because I know that they need to remain that way, but we had a a father who shared this very moving story 
about his own experience in that space. And he made a statement in there that stuck with me. And he said that the thing that kept me going when my own children are, are wrestling through these issues, despite the animosity, despite the everything coming back, despite the, the rebellion, the difficulty, the challenge, he said, I look through all the mess and everything else I see around us, and all I kept seeing was a little girl who just needed to be loved. And I think that's the reality. As we look around us, it's so easy to be caught up in the ideology, caught up in the brokenness, caught up in the world is falling apart, what's going on. And I never want us to lose that sense and that reality. That beneath it all are little girls, little boys, are sons and daughters in need of that radical, incredible love that only he can bring. And I believe that's what Jesus is saying, not just a kingdom that reigns, not just redemption and healing and brokenness, but it goes to the heart of identity and who he has created us to be. Blessed are those who hear those words. It's what we were made for. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter. Let's explore this a little bit in a few moments in this particular way. I've been reading a book this past week by a guy, the author's name is Justin Briley, and he has released a book, I think it's the end of last year, entitled this, The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. The subtitle is Why New Atheism Grew Old and Secular Thinkers Are Considering Christianity Again. Now, uh, Justin Briley himself, he, for the last 20 years or so, he's got a very well-known podcast, and he engages with different speakers. He loves to pit kind of a Christian against a, an atheist or a radical feminist against some... Like, he, he holds these what are quite um, meaningful and interesting debates. He's been doing that for the last 20 years, had everyone from the Tom Hollands and Jordan Petersons and Richard Dawkins and N.T. Wright, theologians, atheists, the whole kind of mixture. And he writes this book to talk about some of the surprising trends that he's seen in the last 20 years. He said 20 years ago... New atheism, the new atheists, the movement of new atheism had kind of swept through Western society. It was this proclamation that, well, well God, if he's not dead, he's, he's certainly more than likely not worthy of any attention. And it had kind of swept through the, the intellectual halls. of power. It, was, it was a large movement that had gathered a lot of interest. There was fiery debates between the atheists and you know, the more conservative Christians. And he said this has been this funny trend happening over the last 20 years. And first of all, this is his own words, he said, there was this redefinition of traditional battle lines, probably after the, the last decade or so. He said, all of a sudden I was seeing old school feminists like Jermaine Green and um, uh, authors like J.K. Rowling, comedians John Cleese, philosophers, atheists, who were all of a sudden in alliance with conservative and religious voices in their concerns over the politically correct culture and free speech. So there started to be this kind of shift in one direction. And then he said even more surprising and alarming like that, not only was there a shift in that direction, but he said within the last few years, he continues to interview all of these high-level profile speakers that are either open to Christianity or have decided publicly to profess their faith in Christianity themselves. I've mentioned with some amusement this year, Richard Dawkins, who's obviously most prominently known for his God Delusion book, this very, very prominent atheist who came out and said, well, I'm a cultural Christian, whatever that term means. Someone else was uh, Douglas Murray, very, very prominent atheist speaker. He said, only recently, I'm now in the self-confessedly conflicted and complex situation of being, among other things, an uncomfortable agnostic who recognizes the values and virtues of the Christian faith. An uncomfortable agnostic. What on earth does that mean? <laughs> i got no idea. There's, there's others who, uh, one, one prominent lady that he's interviewed by the name of Ayan Hersey Ali, who was a Somali-born Dutch-American writer. She actually grew up in Islamic faith, left the Islamic faith, became a prominent atheist, someone who, Christopher Hitchens, who of course is one of the, the grandfathers of new atheism, he called her one of the most important public intellectuals ever. Very, very prominent key part of the new atheism movement. And then only um, early this year, she comes out and publicly says this. She says, I've discovered that Christ is the only answer to the problems of the modern world. 
even more strongly. Caused great waves within the atheism co uh, community thinking, how on earth could she now be professing faith in Christ to some degree? I mean, it's happening more and more. I saw a, a fascinating interview with Russell Brand being um, interviewed by Tucker, Tucker Carlson. Is that his name? And um, he says at the end to Russell, would you, would you pray for us? And this, is, this guy's the, you know, the pin-up of a celebrity who is completely anything but a godly role model and yet has had this, this conversion experience, as he calls it. He's been baptized and he got on his knees and he prayed the most heartfelt prayer that I've heard in years. This is only very recently. He's praying, Jesus, we need you in America and you're the only hope for the nation. It was just phenomenal. And so the whole purpose of this book, Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God, Justin's trying to profile what is it that's kind of brought about this change. Well, he's kind of put it down to one thing, and it's really summed up by a quote by Ayan Hersey Alley, who, again, has come to faith. And this is what she says as part of her journey. She says, I would not be truthful if I attributed my embrace of Christianity solely to the realization that atheism is too weak and divisive a doctrine to fortify us against our menacing foes. She said, I've also turned to Christianity because I ultimately found life without any spiritual solace unendurable, indeed very nearly self-destructive, atheism failed to answer a simple question, what is the meaning and purpose of life? You see, as, as Justin points out, he says, rather than new, athe new atheism and this mantra of promoting secular humanism, rather than that bringing about an ushering in an age, a utopian of human flourishing, it's created this purposeless, meaningless void. And I should say up front, it's not to suggest that, that human seculars don't care about meaning and purpose and all the good things in life. The problem is that when you view a world from a consistently materialist position that rules out God, we create a framework that's entirely limited to ourselves. Purpose, meaning, value, everything, it's created and curated here. It's infinitely small. It's incredibly fragile. You ask anybody, say, well, why, why do you do anything you do? What, well, I just try and do my best and make a living. Well, why do you make a living? Well, I want to buy a house. Well, why do you want to buy a house? Well, so I can, you know, roof over my heads and put food on the... Well, why do you want to eat? Like, what's... You just continue. It's reductionist. Ultimately, it's about what I can try and derive out of the enjoyment of a single meal. It's infinitely small and incredibly fragile. And... Christian apologists have been um, calling this for years. Sarah McLaughlin, um, she wrote a great book a few years back called The Secular Creed. And she said, to our 21st century Western ears, love and equality and, you know, raising the poor and, and et cetera, et cetera, they sound like common sense. This is her quote. She says, but they're not. These truths have come to us from Christianity. You rip that foundation out. You don't uncover a better basis for human equality and rights you uncover an abyss that cannot even tell you what a human being is. And so that is what he suggests is fundamental and is actually becoming a catalyst for turning back to God. And see, here's the wonderful picture. Here's the positive. Is in contrast to that picture, Christian meaning has a breadth so encompassing. It stretches from eternity past to eternity future. From the beginning to end, it's his story. Ordained, created in love, he predestined us. It encompasses and it enlightens every breath. If ever we struggle, we just need to look up and see, not irreducibly reduce things to something small that I can derive. The believer has the capacity to sit back and savor every angle and perspective and allow that breathtaking perspective to illuminate every aspect of our lives. Now, it's a fascinating book, and I, I, if you're interested, I definitely recommend reading it. But the thing that I loved even more than that, see, this is not just an academic turning back to God. And I still have many wrestles and doubts with what a, a cultural Christian even means and where it's going to go. But he also points out that there is um, underlying symptoms of a grassroots awakening of hunger in God, particularly in the younger generation. See, statistically, Gen Z, 
according to all statistics, whether it's Australia, the US or the UK, are the least likely to align themselves with traditional religion. In the US, it's 3 in 10, the UK, 50% or more, similar in Australia. And yet, there's plenty of research and statistics that he mentions that talk about the fact that despite their um, unwillingness to identify with a specific religion, there is a spiritual openness that 25 to 50% say that they pr pray and believe in God. That over 75% of non Christian students said they would love to come to church and find out about Jesus. In fact, we, we look and he profiles in one of his online documentaries, The Outpouring at Asbury, this, this movement of God amongst university students in the US that happened last year where all of a sudden hundreds of thousands of Gen Z were coming to this one little university in search of a meaningful encounter with the living God. A guy called Trevon Wax who writes for the Gospel Coalition, he wrote recently a couple of articles that he entitled the rumblings of revival in Gen Z. Don't you love that? The rumblings. This was his statement. He said, Gen Z is spiritually starved. The disorientating circumstances of the last few years, a global pandemic, countless mass shootings, the woke wars, contested elections, rapid inflation, widespread abuse scandals have created a famine of identity, purpose, and belonging. Gen Z is hungry for the very things the empty, desiccated temples of secularism uh, consumerism and global digital media cannot provide, but which Jesus can. Now, that was a mouthful, but I say all of that hopefully to encourage us and to agree and to stir our faith in line with what Justin and, and I've heard a number of other commentators talking about, recognizing what we believe, what we pray, what I'd love to see us press into, a turning of the tide and a rumbling of revival and, and a generation that is rising up that's hungry for a real, authentic encounter, a genuine encounter which is something that Jesus proclaims and even now modern atheist sec secular individuals are proclaiming that can only be found in Jesus. I pray that we will see that. And I believe we'll see that as we recognize that Jesus has come as the king to reign. He's come as the, the one who would put things right. He comes as the one who redeems, but he comes as the one who satisfies the longing of the human, human heart. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty again. So what can we do in response? I don't know if someone is able to come and play as we finish this off. The first thing is to recognize there is something on offer here. There is. If it helps, you can use that picture of a very expensive but very delicious steak dinner. There is something far beyond anything we could imagine. Something far more deeply satisfying. The truth is every, every time we gather together, I pray and I hope that whilst we're here, that is our reality, to feast upon the goodness of God, to let it wash over us afresh, to let it grab a hold of us and awaken us to His greatness and His goodness, but also to stir our hearts that there is something that more and more it goes to the very reality and need of the world around us. You and I carry something that goes to the essential longing of every person that we see around us. What a privilege there is not just to savor and enjoy us, enjoy that for ourselves, but to invite others to the meal of His grace, to come and feast at the table. You no longer need to turn to the junk food to snack on the little trappings of this world that statistics that a generation has shown leave us more miserable and depressed and empty and thirsting for something that is real and genuine. What a privilege it is that we can make that known. But underneath it all, 
is the reality of sons and daughters amidst the animosity, amidst the opposition, the name calling. It's just people who are broken in desperate need of the love that only Jesus can bring. To hear those words, you are my beloved sons and daughters. You are declared righteous. You're declared loved. You're declared worthy. Your life has meaning. It has purpose. It has value. That's the reality of Jesus. Can we pray? So, Father, thank you this morning for those words. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For those who hunger and thirst for that, for that which is good, they will be filled. So I pray, Lord, first of all, for each and every one of us here. Would you help us examine our hunger? What is it, Lord, that has been driving our hunger and our thirst? So often, Lord, if we're, we're honest, it's, it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. It's a little bit of social affirmation. It's a little bit of worldly pursuits. A little bit of building my own empire. Father, would you reveal to each and every one of us the futility of idolatry, the emptiness of pursuing anything else other than you. Lord, would you help us lift our eyes to you this morning? For each and every one of us, Lord, would you hear us, help us hear those words of a loving Father who says, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter. You're forgiven. You're redeemed. You're restored. Here's a ring for your finger. Here's a robe to cover your nakedness. Come on into the, the celebration of what he's made available through his own death and resurrection. Lord, help that truth to reassure, to reinvigorate, and to satisfy the longings of our heart. And Father, I want to pray and thank you for the fresh stirring that is, that is obvious. The conversations I have with a generation around us, not just young people, but a generation who even ones who bought into ideologies and the lies of this world. The deep down but beneath the prickly exterior, there is a genuine hunger. The hunger that only you can meet. So Lord, as we have prayed all the way through this season, may we be salt and light. May we be a people who with great joy and with great passion invite others to come and partake of that which you've made freely available. The deep satisfaction that goes to the very essence of who you've called us to be. What a privilege to point a world in need to the only one who is the answer, to Jesus. Amen.